We've got David Sampson and Adnan Verk. They are ready to go. Uh, Billy's already in the background causing chaos. In honor of Robert De Niro at 79 years old, having his seventh child. That's $5 uh, to Adnan there for just coughing right into the mic by way of introduction. Irresponsible and selfish, you called De Niro, right? Absolutely. I mean, I don't think that that's like a crazy thing to say. I mean, maybe it's not a popular thing to say out loud, but like that child is $10. going to grow up without Jesus. That child's going to grow up without a father. Whoa. Like, and you're a hundred percent in control of that situation when you're having a kid at 79. Also will grow up very rich. Yeah, but without a father, especially during the important years, like you have to figure by third grade, De Niro's done. I'm it, with it, Billy. Wrap it up. It's kind of sad, though. Like I saw that story, and like some people are like, "Oh, hey, look at him. His dick still works." And it's like gross, number one. But two, like it's kind of sad knowing that that kid's gonna go through that. But if you ask the kid when the kid's twenty or twenty-five, the kid will be happy to be alive. I don't like my ally. Oh, yeah. I mean, the kid will be happy to be alive. He won't be happy that he doesn't have a dad, though. He'll have a great IMDb page to look back on. All right, but he won't be happy as a second grader at the funeral. Well, he will have to deal with parent-teacher conferences where the teacher says, oh, it's so nice of your grandpa to be here. Regardless, get that long. in honor of Robert De Niro, we are going to do the top five Robert De Niro movies of all time. Wow. Adnan has come up with his list. David Sampson has come up with his list. You should listen to Cinephile if you want to get down into the weeds on really the uh, sculpting that is filmmaking. David Sampson watches a movie every single day, reviews one on Nothing Personal every weekday on the Levitard and Friends Network. So let's start, David Sampson. Do we have the fanfare ready back there? David Sampson, start with number five. The fifth best Robert De Niro movie of all time is blank. Casino. <laughs> Enough said. Sharon Stone, you had me at hello. Can we go to number four, please? Casino, uh, well, I want to get Adnan's opinion. First of all, I don't know if that's in his top five, but I will stop on Casino every time it's on, and it is always on. You can't say enough said and then say more. That is correct. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Adnan, how do you feel about that selection? Is Casino in your top five? <laughs> Eminently rewatchable, fellas. I really love it. It's not in my top five, but I do love the scene where he says, there has to be an equal number of blueberries in every muffin. I wish I was that exacting in my own career. Terrific film. I love all the suits and the wardrobe as well, but not my list. Go ahead, David. If we have no crossover, if we have no or one crossover, I'm going to be embarrassed because I think my list is the list. But I'll, I think number four will be on your list because you are a cinephile. You know good movies. He did a movie in 2012 with an all-star cast, Paul Dano, Julianne Moore, Olivia Thurlby. It's called Bean Flynn. That's the fourth best Robert De Niro movie. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here's what I love about David. He'll he'll troll me with at least one of these selections. Like there's there's no way being Flynn is a top five Robert De Niro movie. If we're doing just latter day De Niro, like his last twenty years, of which let's be honest, he's had quite a few stinkers. Then being Flynn should be in that list. It's a decent film. It deals with homelessness, economic inequality. He's playing a cab driver. Fun to see De Niro playing a taxi driver again, which I'm sure taxi driver is in David's list. But to put being Flynn as a top five De Niro film of all time, that's laughable. I mean, that, 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 it's, meant, it's, meant to, it's meant to troll me. I know what this is. No, the reason it's not meant to troll you is, and the reason I, I guess why you're saying it's laughable, what, what attracts me to that movie is the relationship between, it's a father-son movie, really, and it's about trying to figure out how to deal with an absent father who only comes into your life when he needs something, and then there's sort of a moment when they look <laughs> at each other and realize that they can never get back what like, they lost. Like the father Ever. De Niro. About his son, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. father De Niro is going to be in about 12 years, an absent one. 12 years. <laughs> That's true. Good callback. You it's have him three. lasting till sixth grade? Being Flynn as number four is a real stunner. That's a stunner. Never heard of it. I mean, it's outrageous, Dan. Again, and I know what David's doing here. And I'm not denying that it is impactful to David. And I agree. It's a good movie. If we look at the last. 12 years of De Niro's career, it's a top five De Niro film. He has 100 movies he's made on his IMDb page. <laughs> this isn't in the top 50. Being Flynn's in the 70s, but, but by all means, no problem. Uh, David, just explain to us here, because Adnan's accusing you some, of something I don't believe to be so. You don't, you don't troll with your movie choices. You take them very seriously. It's so absurd that I didn't want to waste any part of this segment on responding to that. 
because trolling is triggering. Why would I do something to you, Adnan, simply to get a reaction out of you? That's not what makes me happy. What makes me happy is thinking through what movies are meaningful to me and coming up with lists that are real so we can give the audience a value added so they don't just look at, I bet what your top, by the way, I could what? name your top five because all I have to do is search for what are the critics saying that Bob De Niro's top five movies are and there'll be your top five movies. That's not value added. That's like telling me that I should go sign Carlos Correa to a free agent deal or sign Aaron Judge to a free agent deal. That's not value added. Find me the next guy who no one's looking at. Carlos Correa currently hitting 185 right now, so I'm glad you didn't sign him. Shot him with the Twins. Go ahead. <laughs> number, th number, well <laughs> no, done. number three, Samson. <laughs> This is the, the this has to be a crossover. I assume it's somewhere in Adnan's top five. Goodfellas, which is the movie I stop on. It is a, I view it as a Robert De Niro vehicle. I'm still hurt and crushed that Paul Sorvino got overlooked during the most important part of the Oscars, which is the in memoriam, which made me absolutely crazy when they're cooking inside the jail cell. This is a true story. And I can absolutely empathize and love and relate to when he just becomes ordinary after he goes into the witness protection program. Ray Liotta does, who we just lost as well. But Goodfellas is my number three Robert De Niro movie. Outstanding choice by David. I mean, listen, as he mentioned, Servino is the avuncular figure overseeing all the... Leona, it's a breakthrough performance. Pesci won the Oscar, but De Niro's critical. He's the glue keeping it all together. The scene of sunshine of your love, you know, cameras slowly pushing in, smoking the cigarettes, never out on your friends, always keep your mouth shut. He's right about it being a star vehicle. Without De Niro, they couldn't get financing for Goodfellas, if you can believe it. So great choice, David Sampson. Goodfellas at three. My timing, well my timing before we get to number two was pretty poor here just because I'm still learning where things are on the soundboard. But in reference to your casino scene where De Niro is telling the chef in the kitchen to have an equal number of blueberries in every single muffin, I failed here. Blueberries! My bad. Number two, <laughs> David Sampson. The Robert De Niro Al Pacino vehicle called Heat. Yes. It is a, uh, a long movie, but it is a movie that gets you from minute one and ends in maybe one of the best ending scenes of any De Niro movie when you finally get Pacino and De Niro doing their on the airport, on the tarmac, sort of cat and mouse final scene. And then when they are together in the shot at the end, incredibly powerful. If you've never watched it, please do. It's called Heat. That's number two. Outstanding choice once again by David to quote Tom Sizemore. For me, the action is the juice. I'm in. And he's right about De Niro because he's lean and mean in this film, but also shows emotional vulnerability. He's seen that Amy Brenneman showing the fact he's got the range of a great actor. He's not just a guy who can play hoods and play criminals. This is somebody who wants to settle down one day, but cannot resist the urge to take out that son of a bitch, John Voight, and therefore completely kills him. But great choice by David. When he walks away from Amy Brenneman in that scene at the hospital, that is one of the most emotional scenes of a movie, maybe a top 20 emotional scene when he has to stay true to who he really is. That was De Niro, peak De Niro. Adnan, Sorry, he kills Wayne, he kills Wayne Grove, voice on the phone. Go ahead, Dan. Adnan, uh, spoiler alert, Adnan, is that in your top five? It's not, Dan, no. Okay, I'm looking forward to that top five. Also, the shipping container has assembled the top five as well, but the number one Robert De Niro movie, the number one movie of a selfish, irresponsible Robert De Niro is what? Midnight Run. It is the number one Robert De Niro movie. I've watched it, I would say, 70 times. Charles Grodin in a buddy movie, them going cross-country. To this day, when I wear a watch, I am pressing down on the watch, putting it up to my ear, wondering what time it is. Hey, do you have change of a thousand? Get out of here. Looks like I'm going to be walking. Midnight Run is the number one movie. It will give you a smile. It will give you a tear and it will show you range, the likes of which we really don't see anymore. It's a great comedy and an excellent choice by David. And I interviewed De Niro and years ago, I asked him. And you, Whoa, but, good. I mean, I, mean, I interviewed a interview, You can check it out on Cinefop. You can check past episodes. But Give when he spoke right. about his favorite films, and David will appreciate this, he said, well, it's Raging Bull, and it's also Midnight Run. Like, he himself feels Midnight Run, a real kinship to that movie. But I, I, again, as a number one, ridiculous. Because as David <laughs> pointed out, De Niro's not even the best part of the movie. Groden's hilarious. Yeah. Dennis Farina is hysterical. Is this Moron number one? Put Moron number two on the line. How can this be? It's a great movie <laughs> and a great comedy. He's right. 
But you can't have a number one De Niro movie in which De Niro is probably the third best character of the movie. Whoa. There's no way. I can't do it. Uh, put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Levitard Show. In Midnight Run, was De Niro behind Groden? Because I think he ah. was. I thought Groden's performance was better there. Adnan, let's bang through real quick your top five and then get Dave's thoughts on that before we go to the shipping container. All right, so number five is Mean Streets. Breakthrough performance by De Niro, his first film with Martin Scorsese. It's amazing just seeing him, you know, a mook, a mook. What's a mook? The, the way he's got the hat when he first walks in trying to pick up the girls. He's trying to evade Harvey Keitel. He's hilarious in the movie because he shows that he's a dim-witted thief and that he's got a real charisma and charm to him. Again, it announces arrival as a real major actor. Number four is The King of Comedy. Incredible film. Hold on, hold on. Jeez. I know, I, I don't, I, you go very fast, but I want to get to David's disgust with you right oh. now. Uh, David, what's happening? It's humor. It's not disgust. I want to do one of these segments where we do each other's top five because his top five. Is <laughs> That's so a funny idea. That I, I can't even imagine. Number four. Number four is the king of comedy. <laughs> Fantastic movie. Again, if you ask Martin Scorsese himself, he'll tell you he thinks De Niro's <laughs> best performance is playing Rupert Pumpkin, a Pumpkin, excuse me, P U P K N, which is a real source of comedy in the movie. He's a wannabe stand up, but he's ridiculous. He can't take no for an answer. He's not particularly funny. He's not particularly talented, but he's relentless. It's a razor sharp satire of showbiz. Also features a brilliant performance by the late Jerry Lewis, one of his rare dramatic performances. Number four is The King of Comedy. All of you have seen Joker. Joaquin Phoenix is ripping off De Niro in The King of Comedy and Taxi Driver, and he dances his way to an Oscar. But the King of Comedy is the inspiration for that Todd Phillips movie. It's brilliant. It's number four. David, does it not David, sound like that Adnan is reading off something. David, what is Adnan's number three? Oh, this is great. It, well, I promise you, it has to do something with his favorite movie of all time, which was Raging Bull. He's got to, of course, he made fun of my being Flynn, and he mentioned Taxi Driver. I assume that's there. I wonder whether he's going to put a Godfather in, but he can't do it without Goodfellas. So I, knowing Adnan, it's going to be all Scorsese. So go ahead. I don't know how many minutes we have left. One, one thing I'll tell you about David, his deductive reasoning is excellent. Number three is the same as his. It's Goodfellas. You forget the fanfare, Roy. The music. <laughs> Thank you, Roy. <laughs> uh, we, we already agreed on this. So there's something more to be said about Goodfellas. Number two, the definitive film about loneliness and urban alienation. It's Taxi Driver. Travis Bickle, a character that has literally inspired so many other real-life people and actual actors themselves. Nobody gets inside of the character like De Niro. Drove a cab for months. This was after he won an Oscar, by the way, for The Godfather 2. Somebody recognized him and said, oh my God, what's happened to your career? Now you're driving a cab. But he was so steeped in the mythology of this character. And again, there's so many people out there like a Travis Bickle looking for an outlet, looking for emotion, looking for a connection. De Niro was able to tap into that like nobody else. That's number two. I liked being Flynn better than Taxi Driver. If we're looking at, put it on the poll, if there's De Niro cab movies, would you rather watch being Flynn or Taxi Driver? <laughs> uh, number one, <laughs> number one, Ed. <laughs> such a number great one, question. <laughs> number one is Raging Bull. Wow. All right, all right. It, it, it literally, how could you say all right? It's like the greatest movie ever. De Niro pulled out 60 pounds for the role. He was so good as a boxer. Jake LaMotta goes, he actually could have fought. I'm not saying he could have been the middleweight champion of the world, but he could have been a boxer. That's how good he was. Then he puts on 60 pounds. He's this fat failure doing terrible stand-up in New York City. It's a performance that literally changed his life. He won the Academy Award. Literally. It inspired so many actors. Raging Bull. Give me a stage where this bull here can rage. And though I can fight, I'd much rather recite. That's entertainment. If That's I went to AI or chat GPT and said top five of anything regarding Robert De Niro, or Martin Scorsese, or directors of all time, I believe that AI would deliver the exact same top fives that you do. All right, let's do that here. Let's find on uh, chat GPT or whatever the hell that thing is. <laughs> let's find uh, what we need to find there to come up with artificial intelligence top five. But before we do that, the shipping containers top five. I want to get Adnan and Samson's thoughts to the shipping containers top five. Number five from the shipping container. That's right, Dan. We wanted to make sure that these movies were not uh, excluded from these ever highfalutin lists. I asked so for number five. Number five, The Intern. The Intern. No. No. Cast Anne Hathaway, Renee Russo. Number four. We got it. Dirty Grandpa. Oh. Aubrey Plaza having a moment. Autobiography, oh. too. Christ exactly. almighty. Number three. Maybe light. the best cast De Niro's ever been a part of. Shark Tale. 
Hmm. Number two, Meet the Fockers. I like Meet the Fockers. <laughs> it's, first, it's like the first time I saw him be funny. Number one, of course, Little Fockers. Yeah. Don't you mean Meet the Parents, Dan? Yeah, I'm about to say, yeah, David's right. Meet the Parents is My better bad. than Meet the Fockers. No, Meet the Fockers, Little Fockers. Little Fockers. So obviously blows him out of the water. Meet the Fockers was with Hoffman. Mm-hmm. What? And I Streisand. think you meant meet the parents, Dan. I did. Can you confirm I did. or deny that? I did. I meant yeah. meet the parents. Don't, I've been don't fine. tell Dan what he meant. Dan meant he liked meet the fuckers better than meet the parents, okay? I have nipples, Greg. Can you milk me? <laughs> that was exactly. Good. That was That's meet a good the one. parents. That's well the done. one. Jessica's right. That's hmm. what it should be. Meet the parents. Yeah, it's my, our list. My yours. bad. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Uh, stop have screaming your own at me. List. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being on with us. We appreciate it. No Cape Fear, no Ronin. I mean, wow. Cape Fear, Cape Fear great choice. Good analyze movies. this. I thought analyze this would make the top 10. All right. What about All right. analyze that? No, that's not as good. That that's was our sequel. six. What the hell's wrong with that's you? Fletch Lives. <laughs> do we have the AI yet? Was artificial intelligence, because I do believe the artificial intelligence De Niro list would look more like, uh, more like Adnan's than Samson's. I'm working on it. Okay. Are well, you subscribing to ChatGPT right now? I'm trying to find someone at Metal Arc who is subscribed, so I don't have to subscribe. <laughs> we do have one from the back room with ChatGPT, so we can deliver that. All right, let's do that. Or can we get Taylor back? Oh, no. Number five, Casino. That was David's fifth. <laughs> number four. Number four, Goodfellas. That was both of their number threes. Mm-hmm. Number three, Raging Bull. Two better than this. Uh, number two, Taxi Driver. Looks a lot like Adnan's list. Number one, The Godfather Part Two. Neither one of you had The Godfather. Too easy though. I mean, <laughs> uh, Billy, why are you so mad? You wanted AI to come up with what? I was trying to get him to say Meet the Fockers was number one. <laughs> Adnan, you are AI. I hope you're proud. Really adding great value. AV meet AI. I'll take it. If you've been listening to this show every minute of it, you know that earlier I I mentioned that um, Sequest, the beloved NBC show starring Jonathan Brandis and Roy Scheider, correctly predicted a Marlins World Series championship. I say corrected. They predicted a 2010 Florida Marlins World Series championship. So apologies for the inaccuracies. Very important bit of housekeeping. Roy got it exactly right, though, right? Roy's None of Roy's Back to the Future information is erroneous. That was off the top of his head. Yes, the Florida team that was represented in Back to the Future Part 2 lost to the Chicago Cubs. Yeah. It's like if Roy read an encyclopedia every night, but the only things in the encyclopedia were trivia facts from movies that came out between the years of 1975 and 1995. Can we do this? Can we do a, a bit of Stump the Roy where we ask him questions that he shouldn't know from a bygone age on the details of really stupid shit? I think it would make for a funny game show. Stupid Under the one odds. Who would have guessed it? I wish I could go back in time, put some money on the Cubbies. Speaking of stupid <laughs> if I may, there have been a lot of stupid things on Twitter the last few weeks because of the writer strike. People posting videos and being like, see, this is bad TV writing. Look at this clip. One of the things that has come out of it is the resurfacing of that clip from One Tree Hill where uh, a dog eats a, a heart, a human heart. And I, I, I still can't get over this. Mike Schur produced this TV show. Did he? Yeah, he was a producer. This was years and what? years ago. He was in the oral history article that I read in The Ringer. But the scene is essentially, and I, and I truly don't know anything about One Tree Hill. All I know about it is Chad Michael Murray and, and the oh, what scene. A name. But there is a heart transplant patient waiting to get his heart. And the dog. And the doctor or, or someone with a, a styrofoam <laughs> cooler walks into the hospital, trips over a dog leash, and then the heart spins out of the cooler onto the ground, and then the dog gets loose, picks up the heart in his mouth, and runs away. This is what we're defending through taking public stances on the side of the writers? This? 
I, this I, this is the most stunning television clip I've ever but seen. But it's in terrible, my life. right? It's truly. But it, these were the regular. These weren't. These weren't writers like oh scab no, writers. I, these were the regular writers what, of I, One Tree Hill. What I'm hoping you're saying is that Mike Schur is responsible for a viral sensation of a shame-filled clip of how poorly television is done when professional writers are involved more or less yeah in the oral history they actually mentioned like this was after they had already achieved the 100th episode of the show which is a huge milestone which means that yeah, people are watching your show and actually care about it and they just were like ah how can we make this crazy dog eats a heart all right let's go for it and thanks to twitter now it just has been at the top of my feed for like a week and i can't I can't get over it. Like, I can't stop watching this clip every time I well, see it. Well, next time he is on, we have not talked to him enough because I was hoping to stir some of that Boston angst, but he's very busy picketing and his schedule. All of a sudden, he's been an irresponsible intern. He's not around or is available. Uh, the Stugats is strong in everybody. Um, a story that we somehow didn't get to from earlier this week, though, that I wanted to ask you guys about because it sounded really deeply horrifying to me and something that I had never considered that would be a tremendous curse to wish upon someone. Bo Jackson is having a procedure for the fact that he hasn't been able to stop hiccuping for a year. Wow. For a year, oh, he can't stop hiccuping. I can't imagine. Wait, what's the procedure? I, don't, I didn't know there was a procedure. Wait, I, the procedure should be the doctor's like, we're going to put put you under anesthesia. We're going to do a procedure. And then you come out of the procedure and the doctor's like, it didn't go well. And you're like, oh, oh, oh. It's called the, did it work? I you were going to say, <laughs> we'll put you under. And then you come back, boom. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah. The cure for hiccups is, uh, there aren't, aren't there supposed to be a couple of them? Yeah. You scare somebody. There's another one, though. You, That's you, well, there was you a, hold there your was, breath. There was holding your breath. He says he's tried everything. And then he mentioned smelling a porcupine's butt mm. and i haven't heard that one I, I, never... I looked it up it's a it's just a joke he was making <laughs> chris cody <laughs> i was like this chris would be an odd remedy I, Did you guys I, know that was a thing i'm I like thought, i think he's going for something but for a second there i thought chris cody looked up something else like well <laughs> looked up the butt i get it when you go tried <laughs> everything this seems a horror the sleep has to be impacted by this i'm assuming yeah. it affects the sleep i don't when i assume hiccups i don't know if it's Normal hiccups that every couple of seconds you're hiccuping, which I imagine would deteriorate your body in a way that was pretty horrible the, if you were doing it always for a year. The worst hiccup is the one that has a longer space in between hiccups because you always think, maybe it's gone now. And then right when you think, like, oh, I finally got to be it. torturous. So you'd prefer just a constant rhythm of them? Yep. Wouldn't you prefer, the, if, if you're going to have it for 10 straight months, I'd at least prefer, oh, maybe sometimes I get 20 minutes where the, it no, goes away. No, dude, because then you think, oh, I'm cured. I, that, 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 I would rather be constantly miserable than being told you're not miserable anymore. Ha, psych, you are miserable. That's, that's the worst. Do you worst. believe you can hiccup in your sleep and sleep? No. No, you'd wake up. No, you've gone too far. Well, but this is, I but mean. But I know, I, the sleep thing is, how, A, how are you eating? Because when I have the hiccups, I can't eat. Like, you can't, like, uh, eat food. Well, you got to be quick. Yeah. Uh, you got to be faster than that. But how do you sleep? And how do you shower? Did oh, any of you shower easily. Did any of you know, shower? Shower I, I mean, you might inhale some water. It might no, go down your nose. No, 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 no. <laughs> I believe that most of the people <laughs> listening Wrong to this, pipe. like me, are receiving the information of Bo Jackson, one of the greatest athletes ever, hiccuping, can't stop it, needs to have a procedure, been dealing with it for a year, I think everyone's reaction is to recoil there and think to yourself, I did not realize that hiccups could grip you and not let go. Yeah. You know what the most torturous part of that might be? Everyone that's introduced to you having this issue, thinking they're the smartest person in the room. Did you try drinking upside down? Yeah. yeah. You, don't, you don't think Bo knows? Bo knows. Bo knows. Bo shred it all. Did you try drinking out of the front of your cup? Bo knows. How, wait. He's tried everything, including sniffing a porcupine's butt. I, I mean, get... he may have tried it. I actually just mentioned drinking water this morning. I had uh, water go down the wrong pipe. We all agree, right? That's the worst. It's That's even worse bad. than 10 straight no. months of hiccups. Right, I mean, well, yeah, if, if it results it in death. Scary. And then we got to thinking, shouldn't we by now have, like, multiple pipes? Or it should be one pipe. It should be one pipe. That's what it was. Because we do... 
What's the deal? We with have too many pipes. How do you? How would you eat and breathe if you had one pipe? The body needs to figure out a way to know: is this air or is this water? It does generally. No, <laughs> that sounds but like that's, a segment on a show. But every once in a pipe. while, is this air? Hey, and I'm your host, the Windpipe, and today we're playing: is this air? Uh, our contestant today from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Jessica Smetana. What happens there when it goes down the wrong pipe? Is like I start to drink and my like esophagus is just like, oh, I don't know. He must not. He's definitely not drinking right now. Here's your first item: a marshmallow. Ding, dong, ding, dong, ding. <coughs> oh, sorry, it was not air. Even though mostly, it's not technically air. Tell her what she's won, Michael. Cotton candy. Thank you, <laughs> Chris. I don't agree with you, and I don't think the audience would agree with you, that something going down the wrong pipe is worse than 10 months it's of close. hiccups. 10 the months? Wrong, the wrong pipe is scary. I had water go down the wrong pipe while I was crossing the street last weekend in New York. West Side Terrifying. Highway, to be exact. Ooh. Terrifying. Ugh. I was walking across the highway like, <laughs> I'm okay, I'm okay. Because everyone's trying to decide if they're going to give you the Heimlich or not. And you're like, I'm okay. Because you, you always have to start talking like, oh, my, don't that, touch me. I'm good. I'm good. I can't it's imagine. A real struggle. I can't imagine a lot worse of a feeling in my temporary panic. You say water's terrible. I had that happen to me in college with Rumpelmans, the thick peppermint <laughs> schnapp. Ew, it went down your esophagus? I haven't been able to have it since, obviously. Dude, it was just a syrupy, like, burning. Did it burn? Oh, yeah. Shooting toothpaste. I mean, and I'm coughing and scared. Did it come out your nose? You ever have that where it goes down the wrong but pipe? But 10 months of hiccups. Saw, 10 months of hiccups. I saw someone uh, in one of these stupid TikTok things um, smoke a Carolina Reaper. Like, he put it in a bong, and he smoked it, and it looked like the most pain I'd seen someone undergo. Freedom part two. Didn't vet the pepper. <laughs> to America's. Freedom diet two. Free this dumber. Time, they're dumber. They want us to do it again. Free dumb and dumber? No. Wrong pipe? No. Not doing it. Why not? As, as we covered earlier, not doing it. You guys, it. I, I feel like this would be a great thing in the new studio. Oh, it'd be awesome. How comfortable this place is. You guys is. are talking about a trauma of mine. I've had two mental health breakdowns. One of them happened after freedom. What if we only got to work once a month, but it had to be a 24-hour show once a we month? We did this bit. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm so down. Those other 30 days. <laughs> I like how now, now everyone's on board. Remember, Chris? When oh, you first I, flooded, everyone was like, no, that's terrible. Right, what kind of life would that be? Now everyone's like, yeah, give me 24 12, hours. 12, 24-hour shows a year. Oh, my God. And then the rest of the year, we don't work. We're just chilling. That's the Howard Stern schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see this about Howard Stern? Yes. About Howard Stern. Do you guys see this? We covered it, but I would love your perspective. I didn't see it. Okay, so Howard Stern was complaining that, like, the – Players at Nick games don't know who he is. Like, they come up and they say what's up to Spike Lee and they hang out, but they don't say anything to Howard Stern. And he surmised that this is because he's white. That's why they're not coming to say what's up to me. This is kind of like the John Mulaney bit, right? Like no one in rehab knew who he was. He felt Maybe it's just because you're not that famous Dude, to this group of people. Let me tell you something. That part of that stand-up spoke to me so goddamn loud, man. Because that's happened to me where it's like, like exactly how we described it. Where it's like, okay, I mean, like, prepare yourself. There's going to be a bunch of people want to ask a bunch of questions about the playoffs and stuff. Just be cool. And then you go in and you're just waiting and everyone's kind of being normal and like, what's going on? And then finally someone asks you what, what you do and you're like, what I do? I just skeeted. Let's hear Richard Dreyfus out. <laughs> I'm saying let's hear Trump out. Wrong pipe. I thought I thought you meant something different. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm just wanting to come to America, all of you now, and say. I mean, it is acting, isn't it? When does it stop being acting? I got it all wrong on Trump. Have you watched a Little Mermaid? Last night, he changed my mind. It was the charisma. 
Can we talk about how Joe, Big Joe Harper looks like the seagull from Little Mermaid? <laughs> oh. <laughs> they did this to him yesterday in the shadows. They weren't too scared to do it to his face. Fire the cowards. Alarm. Fire alarm. The cowards. <laughs> the cowards. 24 hours later. It's uncanny. 20, it's unbelievable. Guys, it's uncanny. It's ridiculous. No, it's a thing. You're a Hopper. coward. You're a coward. The only thing I really don't like about the Levitard show, someone writes in, is how they try so hard to make F1 racing a thing. Is that guy? We have been trying over the last year. It is a thing, though. Yeah. Like, objectively, no. yeah, it's a thing. Because we made it a thing. Because we, this show. We're literally making it a thing one minute at a well, time. Well, we're trying. Like, okay. I get one freaking minute. <laughs> one minute a week. Give me a break. I'm talking as fast as you possibly can. I didn't even do it this week. Sometimes I wanted to, in French. I wanted to I was do a wedding. more of it, but Chris Weddingham had a thing. <laughs> and uh, Mike Ryan, the only parts of this that Miami likes uh, and is about is Formula Juan, the party. Is uh, that's when we talk about it when Mike Ryan has snorted the entirety of a weekend because the very famous people who gather around the fashion and fancy and famous and cool go to this party. This is now this is now a style. It's a brand. If you are a celebrity who shows up at one of these things, I was taken aback a by how many people I know who were at this thing seemingly to party. I didn't how they get access. I don't know. And then b, I realized that it was at the same time as the Kentucky Derby. And it stole all the thunder for the Kentucky Derby. You remember Kentucky Derby? Like everyone would dress up and wear the stupid hats and drink their mint juice. They still did it. A lot of and people they still like did it. They do it every the year, but no. horse racing is dead. I it's mean, dead. You know that. Yes. No, that as like a celebrity the event. The horses are dead. I mean, the horses. Yeah. The, horses the horses are dying. Are dying. And the yeah. second someone won a triple crown, a horse won a triple crown, sport was over. Mm. Yeah. But the, the the celebrity kind of attendance was was out. Everyone was down here for Formula One, which, by the way, a lot cooler. More horses, more horsepower. He's got a point. Was that all a setup just to get to that? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Let right. me ask yep. uh, you group, uh, the oh, entire my. group, thank you. Uh, it means good for some of those. I wanted to ask the entire group here about a couple of different stories that, as I love, uh, with many carbs, have arrived on my plate from cars to carbs. I want to talk about pasta, and I want to talk about rice. I want to talk about in New Jersey, what is the backstory? I've told you this before in South Florida. I'll be walking along and there will be a, uh, a shoe in an alley covered by male tidy whities And I'll be like, what's the backstory of what happened here? How did this happen? In New Jersey, hundreds of pounds of cooked pasta was just dumped in the woods in New Jersey. And it's a mystery. Do any of you have a theory on why someone would do that? What the backstory is for that? And do you imagine that animals would then descend upon the pasta and just spend a lot of time eating delicious pasta, pasta in the New Jersey woods? Well, here's the thing. According to the mayor of this town, it was just pasta. Quote, no sauce, no gravy, no cheese, just piles of macaroni. So I'd say if I were an animal in the woods, I'd probably be like, hey, I can take a little shaved Parmesan on this. But it was 15 wheelbarrows of pasta, 500 pounds. This wasn't just like a little bowl of pasta spilled on the ground. This was mountainous piles of pasta. How many pounds are there in a ton? Is it uh, 3,000 th 3, 2, 2, 2, pounds in a quarter so ton? Is this yep, cooked or exactly. uncooked? It's cooked. It's mountainous cooked. piles of pasta. It's cooked. It was uncooked. No, it was pasta. cooked. No, it was cooked. No, it's cooked. Look at it. Yeah, that's not that's the biggest part of the mystery. Yeah, that's cooked. Reading the headline right now, it says it's uncooked. A lot of it's like one night at Olive Garden's <laughs> all-you-can-eat pasta and breadsticks worth of pasta. Wait, did it arrive uncooked, but because of humidity and heat, then got cooked? I think so, because I read a possible... Hypothesis a as to what uh, a possible a hypothesis. They did call uh, hauling out the pasta mission impossible, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Uh. A possible hypothesis, <laughs> which was that the missing mystery pasta. I don't know why I said missing. It's not like it's like. No, a they found it. It's not missing anymore. Amber yeah. alert for the pasta. The mystery pasta uh, was dumped in the woods, and I don't. 
think this makes any sense. I should preface, but you're not postulating. I'm not. I am. <laughs> hey, oh. oh my god. That was good. That was really good. <laughs> Allegedly, yeah. it was from a man whose parents had passed, passed, oh, away. passed, passed away. Passed away. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Who had passed away, and he was dumping out the contents of their pan- pantry. Can't really make that one into pasta. No. And, Why was uh, he cleaning out the, the pantry? Because they passed uh, away. Oh, oh okay. Uh, yeah. I can't believe you made me do that. Like, Anyways, yeah, like, I don't like. Uh, good try. Look, <laughs> my grandparents sure wasn't an were little Italian hoarders <laughs> born in the Depression era. Oh, and they were used they to have. Frugula? <laughs> frugula? <laughs> they used to have pounds and pounds of food that they would hoard because they were afraid, you know, they were afraid to get rid of anything. And it, when they died, there was not nearly this much pasta. Like, this is an absurd amount of pasta. So I'm not entirely sure not, if I'm that buying doesn't this exist. Too much. Story. Pasta. Put it on the I poll, please. I didn't say it was too much. I said it was an absurd amount. At Levitt, yeah, it was Chris, one night at Olive Garden. Yeah, Chris. Next time we ask you for a penny for your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, someone got off a good one. <laughs> Chris Cody, what's up? You have said something, and I did not know that you cooked at all. Your father is a very good cook. I was not aware that you were a cooker, but you made an admission, also in the carb category, that you do not wash your rice. Correct. And a lot of people looked at you with a lot of judgment. It didn't feel like that was a comment you made and then were able to defend it with conviction before a bombardment of people I also didn't know were cooks. Uh, really berated you for not washing your rice. Yeah, I think that everyone's full of it. I think that it's, uh, first of all, I don't want this, to, this is not a blanket statement of I don't wash things. I am things. full of rice, actually. I wash my fruit, I wash my veggies, anything I feel like has been fondled before I got it. If, if it's something that can be grabbed, like the actual thing that I'm going to be eating, I'm going to wash it. But the rice, okay, do you guys wash your pasta too? Like, tell me why well, I, I have to wash I rice. I do wash my pasta because I eat gluten-free pasta because my life is sad. But you're supposed to wash the starch off of it. And, like, rice flour, it create, there's, like, a film on it. And if you wash it off, then it is it tastes better. All right, it, I w- it cooks better. All right, the, I will try it. I thought it was just, like, a, a, like a germ thing. No, what? You, you thought, thought it was a germ You thing? thought people I, were Why are we? Why do you wash off germs, rice? Why do you, I mean, why do we wash off fruit? Because of germs, no, no? You thought it was a germ thing, oh, though? I mean, yeah, I did. It's in a box. That's why I don't wash it. Well, I'm with you. Thank you. First of all, everyone, like, now everyone in here, no one wants I, to say, wait, someone, is okay. anyone going to... Have you never washed it and you. seen Thank you. The, the, like, white, the white water come off yeah. of the rice, yeah. though? No, because I don't I see do that, it. I see it come off when I put it in the boiling pot. Yeah. I, I don't do yeah. that. Did you I think d- it was because of the pasticides? I, uh... No, 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 no. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. That's that's good. Did there? You can't get sent to the penalty box for a keem next slap. I got you. It's just come on. I, I, every time I do something like this, everyone wants to back away. Mike at least is admitting here that he does it as well. I do wash my my rice, my rice? and my pasta in boiling water. Yeah, same. <laughs> Where all the stuff comes out. Yeah, and it tastes fine. I just want you guys, you guys are looking at me like my rice must taste terrible. No, I'm you, looking at you must. funny because you thought that it was like a germ thing. I mean, which is funny. Th- wait, so you're telling me with an apple, like when I wash off my ve- fruits and veggies, that's what am I washing off there? That germs. is a germ thing, yeah. but yeah. It's oh, okay. also there's yeah. what a fool I that's am not, to think that not, the rice thing not, was. There's no, also wax not, it, on the outside of produce that you can like wash out. off too. For Chris, a lot it's of you them. thinking the pasta in the box is a germ thing. It's not a germ thing. She's just giving you a way to improve your pasta. That's I, all. I, it's intriguing to me that she says it'll make it taste better because I, since I thought it was a germ it's thing, it's a texture thing. I'm intrigued by now. I'm gonna try washing it. You don't wash fruit because of germs. You wash fruit because of the pasta sides as it's both. Jeremy said it, uh, the residue is still on it so you're trying to rinse all that off there's also little buggies that you see yeah. sometimes yeah, and they buggies. put it like underneath the microscope which is like really gross because like, you can't see the buggies because they're so little whittle I, I think that we have someone else in here I bet someone you, in here's here, the thing someone around here doesn't also wash the rice and they're too ashamed well, to say it Mike's the only one with the guts right now, hold so. on a second Dan doesn't wash his rice I could tell I could see it in his eyes you know that this is weird because you brought this up for this exact thing like if you thought this was normal you wouldn't have brought this up as a topic like you brought this in and said I have a controversial take well, because you know that you're going to get this pushback. It was back. just because I, I was... You can't pretend. Like, you're reading, surprised. Like, oh, my God, I can't believe everyone's attacking me. I was me. watching a YouTube video and a, a recipe, and they were like, make sure before you do this rice part, wash it. And I was just like, skipping that part. 
You and thought they were being a linguini? And it just, in my mind, I was like, am I weird for this? So it's more of a rinse than a wash. You know what I right. mean? Like, you're not putting soap in there. You're just kind of, like, rinsing this, it off. No, you right. should put soap in there, too. This, this oh, segment yeah, has great. taken such a far folly from where it started. <laughs> I'll go. Farfalu is a type of pasta, though. <laughs> we got we, the joke. We, we got the joke. I, I mean, the the, 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 yeah, uh, thank you. I appreciate you, you explaining you how many different layers the joke had. The Do you remember last week, Dan, when you were upset you missed his flight? Thank you. I mean, there he is. As, on his way out, he just uh, it, the chair hits the microphone. Great punctuation. Excellent work by Chris you. Chris Cody, did you try to get a line off? Nah, there? I didn't say anything. What are you yeah, talking about? Yeah. <laughs> Go sit with him. Yeah, Chris Cody. Oh, no! Wow. <laughs> And Jeremy, <laughs> even though Pasta Sides was good and got the Hakeem Nicks laugh, you go too. Oh, wait what? a minute now. I no. will not, no, I will not disrespect the penalty box. You guys keep testing the penalty box. When you're told you to go, be us. Whether, you go with him. We're going to have such a bucatini captain and it, here. And it's too bad because I wanted to talk to you about Meg 2 and the shark that ate a, a, a dinosaur. I wanted to talk to you about it, but you blew your chance. I knew you were interested in that movie, and you couldn't help yourself, and you got to be zeding me. Is just go f*** yourself. <laughs> I liked it. It's a shell of himself. <laughs> hey! Roy! <laughs> Let's go! You got thank your you. elbows out. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I also want Elbow is a type of pasta. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I wish... I wish that, we had more people in this yeah. in this room. Roy's well, just gonna uh, seg uh, hijack the segment and bring up John Tortellini now. All right, please leave Tortorella. You I go. would we're, love we're his thoughts on that. United States of Tortellini. Here. You get out of here as well. I would uh, love his thoughts. A pet A for your thoughts. We already Steve see Martin. That. Steve one. Martin. Yeah, Steve Martin is also too. pasta. Roy, you gotta get out of here. I'm sorry. I gotta get out. Okay. Yeah. I'll Stop. see you guys later. Postulating. Go Panthers. Yeah. Already did that one. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have fun this segment. Excellent Just work by you. I would. David Pasternak. Pasternak would have been a good one to use. Shows past its prime. You didn't get the joke right. You have to leave. <laughs> There's no one else to kick out. Ten day Taglioni is in here. Ah. I'll, I'll leave. I'll leave. 